Welcome to the Aviva Experience, a podcast dedicated to surviving the emotional and psychological shit fuckery of midlife. Hi there, my name is Sarah Tuckett, and I'm a somatic psychotherapist based in Brisbane. Let's get on with the show. The best book I read in 2023 was The Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. Now, it's completely irrelevant to this podcast, but it's a brilliant young adult dragon fantasy shagfest. Highly recommended. However, the second best book I read was Brain Energy, a revolutionary breakthrough in understanding mental health and improving treatment for anxiety, depression, OCD, PTSD, and more by Christopher Palmer, who is a doctor and assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard. I had heard him talk on several podcasts, which I'll link to below, and I jumped on his book like a seagull on a chip. It literally could be the most important book on mental health I've ever read. However, it's very sciencey and not for everyone. So today I'm going to summarize the key points that I learned from the book. And I'm going to suggest seven things that you can do to maximize your metabolic and mitochondrial functioning to boost your brain energy and have great mental health. I'm also going to tell you about my own experience with depression and how it was my metabolism that was up shit creek. So the first thing I learned from the book was that we've been doing mental health completely wrong in the Western world. For centuries, we've separated diseases of the mind and body, but they are intrinsically linked. We've also diagnosed mental illnesses based on symptoms, and those symptoms overlap between different disorders, and people with the same disorder experience those symptoms very differently. We've also relied on medications, magic pills to make us happier and calmer. And whilst they are essential for those of us really suffering horribly from mental illness, They don't work for everyone and they're a band-aid at best because what they do is they alleviate the symptoms but they do not cure the underlying causes of our lack of brain energy and poor mental health. So what we need to do is focus on the biological, social and psychological treatments that affect our metabolism. That's the key word there because as Chris Palmer clearly states in his book many times, Mental disorders are metabolic disorders of the brain. So the second thing that really struck me was how he thought of mental illness. He describes mental illness as when the brain is not working properly over a period of time and causes mental symptoms which lead to suffering or impairment in functioning. Now he describes that the brain functions could be either underactive, overactive, or absent. So if your brain functions are underactive, that could be something like depression, where the activity in the default mode network slows down and results in disorganized brain function, or ADHD, where we have a reduction in the activity of norepinephrine neurons, which help people focus and stay on plan and be able to work. An example of overactive brain function would be fear and anxiety, which is where we have hyperexcitability of the amygdala, which is the alarm bell in the center of your brain. And an example of absence of brain function could be something like autism, where there's an absence of neurons or connection between neurons in the brain. So for optimum mental health, what we're looking for is the brain energy to be just right for you. The third thing I learned is that it's hard to measure mental health. What you may not realize is that unlike physical illnesses, where we can do tests, blood tests, heart scans, to objectively measure the signs of ill health, mental illness is all about symptoms, which are subjectively reported by the person suffering. This means that Clinicians that diagnose are listening to your subjective symptoms and they're trying to classify what disorder you have, which is sometimes why people's diagnoses change over time if they see new clinicians or perhaps your symptoms change over time and you get a new diagnosis. However, the truth of the matter is, is that there is significant overlap of symptoms between different disorders. I'm going to quote here from Chris Palmer. He said, 
Mental disorders are not distinct entities. This includes diagnoses like depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, ADHD, alcoholism, opioid addiction, eating disorders, autism, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. There is tremendous overlap in symptoms for different disorders, and many people are diagnosed with more than one. And even among disorders with symptoms that are very different, the underlying biological, psychological, and social factors overlap significantly. What Chris and his colleagues point to is that the underlying pathway of all mental illness is metabolic disorder and mitochondrial dysfunction. Now I'm going to break that down into layman's terms because when I first read that, I had no idea what I was talking about. So firstly, metabolism. That's just how our body creates and uses energy. And when we have problems with our metabolism, we have an energy imbalance. And that's in all the cells of our body, including our brain. And if you can remember all the way back to school, what we were taught largely is that mitochondria are the little energy production centers in our cells. But they are more than that. They are the common pathway to all mental and metabolic disorders. And they have other functions as well, which are they are the master regulators of our metabolism. They produce and regulate neurotransmitters. They regulate our hormones, including our stress hormones, and they regulate our nervous system. So when these little dudes don't function properly, neither does our brain. When brain metabolism is not properly controlled, the brain doesn't work properly and symptoms can be highly variable, but mitochondrial dysfunction is both necessary and sufficient to explain all the symptoms of mental illness. So you might be wondering what causes metabolic disorder and mitochondrial dysfunction? Here's a little list. Stress, trauma, insomnia, heartbreak, inflammation, hormones going AWOL, neurotransmitter imbalances, use of alcohol and drugs, poor nutrition and dehydration, lack of meaning or purpose in life, loneliness even. So let's talk about stress as an example because many of us are suffering from chronic stress. When your body responds to a stressor, the stress response requires energy and metabolic resources. And when that happens, those resources can be diverted from other cells in the body and the brain, and those other cells can suffer. So our stress response is taking up energy that could be used elsewhere. Now imagine that this stress response is chronic, meaning it's long term. That takes a huge metabolic toll and it can lead to mental illness. And trauma has an enormous metabolic impact. It is a major stressor on your metabolism and can push people over the edge into mental health disorder. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own experience with chronic stress, which led to depression, and it was all to do with my metabolism. So back in about 2006, I was doing my first permanent job in Australia. I'd migrated and I'd done heaps and heaps of contract jobs and I just really wanted a permanent job with sick leave and holidays and all of that kind of safety built in. And I was doing a project admin job and I was working for 18 engineers. I loved the people but very very quickly I became incredibly stressed. I knew within one month that it wasn't the job for me. But I stayed because I desperately wanted that permanent job and the safety that it brought me. Three months later, I was severely stressed. And I can remember a friend coming up to me on Christmas Eve and said, hey, do you want to go to the pub? And I was like, no, I just got to get this done. And she said, um, are you aware that you're screwing up your face like a cat's ass? So I knew, I knew then, but I carried on for another nine months. I was having anxious thoughts, my sleep was negatively impacted, and my diet literally was just sugar-based. In fact, I can remember going to Woolies and driving back, and I'd inhaled an entire tray of Tim Tams just on the way back. Twelve months later, and I was completely depressed, 
crying at my desk, unable to work. I can remember one night trying to cook dinner and trying to chop carrots and I just literally didn't have the energy to do so. I felt leaden. I didn't have the energy to get to a gym. I was withdrawing socially. Many a morning, I remember sitting on my bed, looking at my closet going, I have no idea what to wear. I just, I was collapsed. I didn't have the energy to make decisions. So I just sat there like a little bundle of depressed rags. Thankfully, I had a really good GP. And this GP focused more on personal or functional medicine, which is also called integrative medicine. She told me to rest, focus on my sleep and eat really good food. My GP correctly ascertained that it was my environment that needed tweaking. It was my social environment. It was my work environment. And she realized that the band-aid of antidepressants wasn't needed, that I would recover if we could focus on tweaking my lifestyle. And that would help my metabolism and my energy stores recover, as long as I stayed away from the Tim Tams. So gradually, over a few months, with that main stressor removed and my lifestyle tweaked, my brain energy recovered. Through regular yoga, massages, walking, hanging out with friends, my overactive nervous system became more regulated. Through good food, sleep, hydration and movement, my depression completely receded and I started to socialize once more. A few months later, I made my way back into the workforce. My metabolism and my brain energy had recovered. So how can you improve your brain energy and your mental health? We need to look at your entire lifestyle and environment. Imagine you were a plant. I always say this to my clients. If you were a plant, are you thriving? Are you flowering? What vital nutrients are you missing? Are you missing sunlight? Are you missing food or watering? What is it that you need? Now you are unique, your genetic makeup, your environment, your personality. So you need a unique solution for you. I'm going to suggest seven lifestyle tweaks, but please make up your mind what works for you. Now the first one I want to really focus on is social connection. And the reason for that is because loneliness kills Social connection, physical health, and mental health are intrinsically linked. You saw from my example how my social environment was stressing me out beyond belief. And research shows that neglect, abuse, and social deprivation can cause metabolic changes in people's brains, particularly children. Social isolation is a stressor, which as I mentioned above, has huge metabolic impact on your brain. This is because it's taking all that energy that instead could be focused on other stuff. Good social connection is associated with a 50% increase in longevity, i.e. the likelihood of a long life, a strengthened immune system and better recovery from illness, a decrease in levels of depression and anxiety, high levels of self-esteem and connection also leads to this kind of feedback loop where you start to feel better about yourself and about others. You feel you can trust more. You feel like you have more empathy for them and then they in turn like you more. So it kind of this positive feedback loop. So if there was ever a reason to focus on your social connection, it's that. Number two, a positive mindset and knowing your life purpose and meaning. Having a sense of life purpose has been highly associated with both metabolic and mental health. And when people lack a sense of purpose, it appears to induce a chronic stress response and can lead to poor health outcomes. Now I'm quoting Chris Palmer directly there. So my suggestion as a first step, if you don't already know, or if you're feeling this kind of disconnect between what you're doing for work and how you're living your life, I'll pop below some links to finding out your key strengths because I think that's always one of the first steps in finding your life purpose and meaning. Now, I am not saying that you can think your way out of depression. Absolutely not. If someone had told me to cheer up when I was depressed, I probably would have punched them in the face. But there is significant evidence that practicing gratitude journaling can really help because what it does 
as it forces your brain to look for the positive in your day. Even if it's just glimmers of joy, rather than that kind of elusive happiness. It's training your brain to look for optimism. The third thing I'd like to suggest is focus on fun and play. Now, most adult women just look at me with very sarcastic, cynical looks in their face when I suggest this. But being an adult female is highly overrated, especially if you are a parent. Way too much responsibility and not nearly enough fun. But again, it's the impact that stress has on our metabolism that impacts our mental health and our brain energy. So I'd like to suggest that you focus on having some fun and some play in your life. Apathy and boredom are key signs of midlife crisis for women. So lady, if there was ever a time to press that great big fuck it button, do it now. Playing especially with your most important people, will have a positive impact on your stress levels and therefore your metabolism. Number four, food and nutrition. Diet plays a powerful role in metabolism and mitochondrial health. I have just shared with you that during my 30s, during that period of chronic stress, I was completely reliant on sugar mostly in the form of tin tams, to give me energy. And starved of nutrients, my metabolism was up shit creek. You are what you eat. We all know this. But what you eat affects your metabolism and hence your brain energy and your mental health. We all know this, right? But sometimes I need to kick up the bum. So focus on real food. Avoid the additives, the preservatives, the ultra-processed crap. Feed your microbiome and avoid the weird fad diets that really fuck up your metabolism. Lemon juice diet, I'm looking at you. But what Chris points out, which I think is really useful to know, is that even if you're following a really healthy diet, your metabolism and your mitochondria can become impaired. And this can be due to non-dietary factors like genetics, epigenetics, stress, inflammation, insomnia, hormones, medications, etc. So even in cases like these, little dietary tweaks can still play a role in your recovery. He suggests intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. Now that's his thing, that might not be yours, but please contact your GP or a nutritionist, particularly if you're someone who currently or in the past has suffered from an eating disorder. Number five, rest. Look, it's pretty self-explanatory and I'm pretty sure we all dream of it, right? But how many people, and I'm talking about women here, do you really know that are on the go 24-7 unable to rest? The sad fact is if we are unable to rest, we're going to be stressing out our nervous system. And as I've already pointed out, stress is a huge metabolic disruptor. So we really need to prioritize this so we have enough energy for ourselves and others I know how hard this is because I have to force myself to rest on the weekends. Number six, movement. Movement not only improves your physical health, it also improves your mental health. And it does this by releasing these tiny little antidepressant substances called myokines, which science nerds are calling the hope molecules. And even better, if you move with other people, especially people that you know and love, your body will release endorphins and endocannabinoids, bonding hormones, which means you'll feel more connected and safer and bonded to these people. But just to point out, for many of us, exercise does have a beneficial impact on our metabolism and mitochondria, but there are some people who are less likely to have that beneficial impact. So for example, people who are already suffering from metabolic disorders like obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So please see a GP. Also, another thing he sadly points out is that just having a little gentle stroll around the block with your face in your phone is not going to impact your metabolism. To improve metabolic capacity, we need to push ourselves towards getting faster, stronger, more flexible, or doing more reps. What we're doing is increasing our capacity somehow, because when that happens, that's when the number of mitochondria in the muscles and brain cells increase, and that's when the health of the mitochondria improve as well. 
But what I like to suggest is just a little bit is better than nothing at all. What if you just did a few squats each day or 500 meters more walk than you did before? And the last one, sleep. Most of us know that proper sleep will improve our metabolism and let our brain do its self-repair functions overnight. But Netflix is so good and Bridgerton's just dropped the last four episodes of season three, so it's so tempting to stay up. But light, sleep, and circadian rhythms all affect the function of our mitochondria. Getting adequate sleep, getting enough daylight on the back of your eyes, and following a good circadian rhythm will play a powerful role in metabolism and mitochondrial function, mental health, and metabolic health. I'm quoting Chris there. And here are some stats that you might not be aware of. Just one sleepless night can increase our anxieties up to a whopping 30%. Just one hour less than your baseline seven hours of sleep results in poorer mental processes the next day. And the real doom and gloom, the less you sleep, the earlier you are likely to die. So there's a really good reason to switch off the Netflix. Now I'd like to finish this podcast by coming back to the importance of medicine. As I mentioned above, while it might not cure metabolic disorder or mitochondrial dysfunction, which you now know is the underlying cause of mental illness, medical intervention for mental illness can be a lifesaver for many. Some people are suffering horribly in ways that to never experience. And in cases of severe mental illness, medication is essential to save the life of that person. And I 100% advocate for this. I've seen people with severe anxiety respond fantastically to medication and get on with their lives, weaning off the meds when they no longer need it. And I've seen people with severe depression do their absolute best for years with naturopathic supplements, but really suffer and then really get their functioning back when they're on their antidepressants. And they're probably going to stay on them for the rest of their lives. So as I've said, it's a band-aid. It doesn't cure the underlying cause, but it is an absolute essential for many, many people. So if you are suffering from severe mental illness, please supplement your medication with these seven lifestyle tweaks. Don't come off your meds. Speak to your medical professional. Add them on top. And how could I even forget? I'm a massive believer in HRT from perimenopause and menopause. Our brains run on estrogen. And when that puppy runs out, some of you will be suffering from appalling mental health. So go see your GP. And I'll put a link below to the Australian Menopause Society. We've got GPs who are specially trained in menopause. So if you'd like to find out more about Chris Palmer, brain energy and mental health, I'll pop some links below to his website and my favorite interview with podcaster Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I have a question for you. How do you want to feel today? Powerful, playful or present? Download my free guide, Feel your va-va-voom in 60 seconds and find out how.